Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our space forum. I am Bert Dicht, Managing Director of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of my colleague, Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, thank you for joining us this evening to hear Maximizing Your Solar Eclipse Experience. So as always, welcome to the Space Forum. I hope you're going to have a good time. We know we've got some competition tonight that's on television, but we thank you all for taking the time out to join us. As always, uh, here's the quick agenda, a little bit on our virtual etiquette. Uh, then I'll have a few NSS announcements, uh, upcoming Space Forums and Town Halls. Then we'll get right into the program. Then we'll close for the evening. In terms of our virtual etiquette, please feel free to submit a question uh, using the Q&A function. Uh, that is best seen, it's seen by the panelists, and it's much easier to pick out the questions, but you are free to use the chat function as well. We just ask that everybody be respectful of panelists and audience because everybody can see those. Uh, and we did get a number of questions that were submitted beforehand and we'll try to get through as many of those as possible. I think some of them, uh, as I noticed, are going to be in the presentation that Jim will be making. So he'll be answering a number of those things as he goes through his presentation. But any that we miss, we'll obviously catch, come back and take a look at those. As always, if you're enjoying programming like this, the Space Forums and Town Halls, uh, we ask you to please donate to support the National Space Society. Uh, we really appreciate those who have made contributions. We actually got a few great contributions uh, at the last uh, Space Forum. So thank you for that. And we welcome all your donations. Doesn't matter about the size. Uh, we do appreciate uh, giving to our cause. And I'll post the link in our chat function here so you can see that. Also, please complete the, the post Space Forum survey. It only takes a couple minutes. Uh, once you exit the session, it'll come up automatically. It's anonymous, and it really does help us in terms of uh, planning these events. Uh, just a reminder coming up, we, the big thing coming up, and we're going to have a, a town hall to discuss it, is our ISDC, the International Space Development Conference. Uh, and that's going to be held in Los Angeles, uh, May 23rd to 26th uh, at the Sheraton Gateway, Los Angeles. Uh, it's the same hotel we've used uh, the last few ISDCs. It's a great hotel uh, for the ISDC. And the theme is No Limits in Space. We've got a lot of great sessions to space, you know, on space solar power to Mars, to living in space, and so on, with a lot of great speakers. And I highlighted a couple of former astronauts here, uh, Jose Hernandez, uh, who many of you might have heard, he wrote a book about his experiences. He was a, you know, a migrant family. He went as an engineer working for Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and applied to NASA about 10 times uh, to become an astronaut. And of course, he was accepted finally. And he told his story in a book and in a, uh, an Amazon uh, Prime uh, video, which, uh, which was really, really good. Uh, so he will be there. I, I haven't met him, so it'll be exciting to meet him. Uh, and also Susan Kilrain. Uh, Susan was a former Navy test pilot, uh, F-14 pilot uh, as well, and became a uh, shuttle pilot and, and was the uh, uh, on two flights as a, a, a pilot for uh, NASA. So we've got some great, great uh, speakers along with them. So I encourage you to, to see us there in Los Angeles. You get a member discount uh, for registration. And also, early bird registration ends on the 31st of March. And you will save a lot of money uh, by doing that. So, so go in there and register now. It's going to be a great, great event. I hope we see you there in Los Angeles. Upcoming, we've got next week. Uh, you might remember Laura Forzak, who gave us a great talk a couple of years ago on becoming out, outworldly, offworldly. Uh, she has a great book about that. Uh, she's going to be talking about all the things that are happening here on the Space Coast. Uh, lots of new rockets, a uh, lot of companies involved in what's going on. And she's going to just give us a rundown on that. So that's one week from tonight uh, for Laura Forzak. So hopefully you can join us for that. 
We are planning a town hall for the 11th, uh, and that will be to focus in on the ISDC. And we do hope to have several ISDC presenters uh, also on that evening to talk about what they will be talking about at the ISDC. So look for that one. Uh, then we're working on a couple different speakers on the for the 25th of April and also for the 9th of May. So hopefully by next week, I'll have all those two identified. We'll only be doing that additional one in April and one in May because of the ISDC, and then we'll recoup it again uh, in, in June. So, but we're working on some great topics, so we hope you can join us. So before uh, I go into our program, it's always great to have our uh, CEO on board this evening. So I'd like to introduce uh, Anita Gale, uh, the NSS CEO, just to say a few words, Anita. Howdy, welcome everyone. And uh, anyone who's uh, been on one of these uh, forums or town halls where I've been involved as well, you know that I always say this is one of my favorite member benefits in NSS. You don't even have to be a member to uh, to benefit from these. This is a, a great, very topical topic. I, I live in the Houston area, so we're not in the area of totality, but I can drive about four and a half hours and and uh, can be right in the middle. Kerrville, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's my plan because hotels are pretty much booked up, but um, it's, um, it's going to be a very exciting event and it's great to get this preview of what's really going on and, and how to experience it. So thank you. And I'm not going to talk anymore because I know we want to get into this topic. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anita. Again, thanks for joining us this evening. And let's see, we'll get back to sharing my screen. So uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by uh, eclipses as well. So uh, these are pictures that I took the Great American Solar Eclipse, which was back in 2017, uh, that was from Piscataway, New Jersey. We had about a 72% uh, obscuration. Uh, I don't remember the time, so I would have put the time there. But uh, I was working at IEEE and uh, led a bunch of people outside into our parking lot. I was the only one that had glasses. No one else had glasses, so I was sh you know, sharing them with everybody. Uh, and everyone was just amazed. And... So I took that that picture with my camera. And then uh, just uh, last year in October, we had the other solar eclipse, uh, the annular solar eclipse. And that picture was here in Vieira, Florida, about 1.33 p.m., uh, about 55.5% uh, obscuration. So I am looking forward to the total solar eclipse. So I'm going to be heading to Dallas myself uh, to hopefully see it, and hopefully there'll be good weather there. Uh, but uh, uh, it really, it's really amazing. So, uh, and I think it, as uh, Anita said, it's, this is really topical. This is going to be really fun and exciting. So I know you're going to learn a lot tonight about solar eclipses. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, you know Jim very well. He's been on multiple space forums uh, in the past, both as a facilitator and as a guest. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on introducing him, but he is currently the president of the Chicago Society for Space Studies. Uh, he is an NSS uh, ambassador. He's also a, an ambassador for uh, for JPL as well, uh, and a former director for NSS and a former VP for NSS, uh, and a very, very dedicated volunteer. So uh, Jim, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce you or Excited to hear about uh, how we can maximize our solar eclipse experience. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Bert. So I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully everyone is seeing a solar eclipse. And that's what I'm here for, to take you on a journey of discovery about solar eclipses, which is actually a surprisingly fascinating topic. Come on, there we go. Uh, so, sorry about that. Over the course of the next hour, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of eclipses, uh, their role in science, a little about the geometry of eclipses. Uh, and yes, I'm even gonna talk about next month's total solar eclipse. Uh, I'll talk about Eclipse features you want to keep an eye out for, 
and how to safely observe the eclipse. So, you know, I decided to start off uh, with this animation of a solar eclipse as seen on Mars by the Perseverance rover. Uh, what you're seeing is the moon Phobos passing in front of the sun. Uh, you can even make out some sunspots here uh, on the sun. Uh, one thing that's clear is that Phobos is kind of potato shaped, and that's due to its small size. It's only 26 kilometers long on its long axis, so not enough mass to gravitationally uh, create a sphere. And the geometry is such that while pretty cool, it totally lacks the impact of a total eclipse that is in store for us. Now, imagine you're living a couple thousand years ago. You go out and you look up at the night sky. What do you see? You see a mystery. Uh, just what are these unreachable points of light? So you start speculating. For our distant ancestors, uh, the night sky was a lot of things. It was a calendar, it was a timekeeper, a direction finder, uh, it was the home of the gods, a source of constancy. Uh, the sky as such was linked to religious beliefs. And it was a source of omens and could be used to tell the future. People's lives depended on knowing when to plant their crops. If you were a Polynesian, the stars guided you on your ocean journeys. So our month is tied to the amount of time it takes the moon to complete one orbit around the Earth. And the year, a single journey of the Earth around the sun. So for us, the sky was predictable. And it was a source of constancy in our lives, which is why events like comets were seen as omens. So... Think about it. If you're upset by the appearance of a comet in the sky, imagine how people reacted to seeing the sun disappearing. Oh, my God, what had we done to make the gods mad at us? Would the sun ever come back? Now, you know, omens can be good or bad, but when it comes to eclipses, uh, we tend to do assume the worst. So the oldest uh, uh, tables we have of astronomical uh, observations are dated about 1000 BC from the Babylonians. Uh, and now for reference, the oldest record we have of uh, written uh, or of writing is the Kiss Tablet, which is dated, it's Mesopotamian, and that dates to around um, 3000 BC. So we were pretty quick at setting up astronomy as a science, perhaps the oldest science. And that was because of the importance of the sky in our everyday lives. So astronomical observations uh, were important because they were tied to the culture's belief system. And they were also tied into our desire to be able to predict the future. So this is an image uh, of clay tablets uh, of Babylonian astronomical observations. And on the right is a translation of a part of the text and it's tying uh, a prediction of an eclipse with the king's fortunes. And fortunately for the predictor, he was saying that the eclipse would be good news for the king. Now, over on the North American continent, uh, there is this petroglyph carved by the Chaco, a Puebloan Indian culture. Now, we don't know if this representation had any symbolic or religious value, but now some researchers have argued that this is a representation of a solar eclipse 
And that's based on datings of the Chaco culture, the datings of an eclipse that occurred in that area, uh, and the carvings superficial resemblance uh, to some astronomical sketches of the sun's corona as observed during a total solar eclipse. Now, everyone should know the story of Odysseus, right? One of the most famous uh, works of Western literature in which Homer, the author, recounts the 10-year journey of Odysseus, our hero, uh, to return home following the end of the Trojan War. Now, some have argued that the lines spoken here by Theoclamenus, I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, anyway, Theoclamenus speaking to the suitors of Penelope. Uh, some believe that this is actually a reference to a solar eclipse. And as you can see, I've got three different versions you know, of the line here because there are different translations of the line. So anyway, in this instance, um, the omen is foretelling um, something bad for the suitors. If you want to know what fate has in store for them, you're just going to have to read the story. Uh Perhaps most famously, we have what is known as Thales Eclipse, also referred to as the Battle of the Eclipse, which happened when a total eclipse interrupted a battle that was in progress. Uh, the eclipse happens, the two armies stop fighting, uh, the two kings then negotiate a peace treaty which brought about an end to this war between them that had been going on for six years. And then there is this device. Because the motion of the heavens played such a large role in everyday life, they were the subject, they being the heavens, uh, were the subject of serious, serious study. And it was important to be able to know and predict what was going on in the night sky. This instrument was found in a shipwreck off the Greek coast and has gotten a lot of attention, and it's considered to be the oldest analog computer. It is also known to be the oldest bronze-geared device that's ever been found. So via this system of gears, its job was to predict the positions of stars and planets, eclipses, etc. And with respect to eclipses, it could only predict the when and not the where of the eclipse. And it was also a machine uh, used to determine time based on the movements of the sun and the moon. So it's a very interesting story, and I'd encourage you to look it up online. There was a project to create a 3D virtual representation of this device. I don't know what its status is at this point. So... I think it's a wonder to consider uh, that given a total eclipse hits the same location only once every 375 years, that through long-term observation and record keeping, ancient astronomers were able to figure out the underlying pattern of eclipses and were able to then make predictions of when eclipses would happen, with the where part of this being a different issue. So this map happens to show where solar eclipses have occurred during the first 20 years of this century. And to me, it looks pretty erratic. So my hat is off to these ancient astronomers. And it wasn't until 1715 uh, that we actually had our first real modern eclipse prediction. Because even though prior astronomers had been able to predict the approximate win of solar eclipses. It wasn't until Edmund Halley, uh, this is the Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame, uh, he made the first true eclipse prediction that addressed both the when and the where of an eclipse. And he was accurate to within four minutes and 20 miles. 
And he did this because he was using this brand new, well, pretty brand new theory of gravity. Uh, and that was Isaac Newton's uh, Principia, which had been published uh, some 10, 15 years earlier. So I'm going to talk about some of the features you can see when you're uh, looking at a total solar eclipse or at photographs of an eclipse. This way, in all the images that follow, you can try and pick out for yourself the different features that you may or may not see. Something else to think about uh, when observing an eclipse or looking at these pictures is the size of what you're seeing. For reference, you can use the angular diameter of the sun, which is on the order of a half a degree or 30 minutes. And use the knowledge that 60 minutes is equal to one degree. And think about this, at the sun's distance from the earth, that half a degree of angular diameter in our sky equates to 1.4 million kilometers. And I just want to briefly take a quick look at the sun's atmosphere. First, we've got the photosphere, the cool, thin surface layer of the sun, which is what we see. When you see sunspots, you're looking at the photosphere. The next layer uh, is the chromosphere, which is a few thousand, several thousand kilometers thick, and it emits a reddish glow uh, because of superheated hydrogen gives off light at that wavelength. Lastly, there's the most fascinating layer, which is the corona, which is where the solar wind originates. And the corona is so hot that it emits x-rays. And driven by the sun's magnetic field, it extends up to a million kilometers out into space. And we're unable to see it because it is so uh, tenuous. It has a very, very low density. So our first and most obvious feature of a total eclipse is the corona, which is, again, the sun's outer atmosphere. And we can only see it during a total eclipse because of its low density. Now, uh, it's during these total eclipses that scientists are able to use special instruments to measure temperature differences within the corona. Uh, most common instrument is a solar coronagraph. So the cool thing is that these images reveal the sun's magnetic activity because it's that magnetic activity that drives the actions of the corona. Now, when the sun first moves into totality and later when it first emerges from totality, keep an eye out for Bailey's beads. What you are seeing is sunlight that is streaming through the valleys and between the mountains on the very limb of the moon. We know that Galileo observed this phenomena, but it was a uh, the English astronomer, and now I'm drawing a blank on his name, unfortunately. Uh, oh, yeah, Bailey, uh, who explained it in 1836. Uh, and the little bit of red you can see along the limb there is that's light that is coming from the sun's chromosphere, which ordinarily we would not be able to see. Solar prominences are uh, a very cool feature. They're a large plasma and magnetic field structure that extends outward from the sun's photosphere and into the corona. And you see that they have a reddish appearance. Uh, and you can see this is a pretty processed image, by the way. So compositionally, prominences are very similar to the chromosphere. They're both very hydrogen rich and at their temperatures, that's why they're emitting this red light. Now, while the corona consists of extremely hot plasma, 
prominences contain much cooler plasma, but and they can form over time scales of about a day and may last for weeks or months. And as you can see in this image, with the Earth at the proper scale, these things can be huge structures. Now, during a total solar eclipse, you should see two diamond rings. The first will be right before totality starts, and the second will happen right when totality ends. And again, if you look closely at this image, uh, look for what's red, you'll see uh, a couple examples of prominences uh, and some bits of the sun's chromosphere. And this is a composite image of a total eclipse that really extremely enhances uh, detail beyond what you're going to be able to see. But I use it because it makes the features clear. Um, at the top and bottom of the image, you see a lot of lines streaming away from the sun. These are known as polar plumes. Uh, another feature you can see uh, in this image, and they look a little bit like ears. Those are coronal loops. And then a larger structure that you can see is something that's called a helmet streamer. Not a fan of the name, but I can see why uh, if you look uh, at the site, it, doesn't it look to you a little bit like a medieval knight's helmet? So, armed with those examples of solar features, uh, you can look at eclipse photos, paintings, or sketches, and hopefully you'll be able to point out some of the features that you're seeing. So, in this painting, which is, as far as we know, the first painting of a solar eclipse, you can see a representation of both the corona as well as, let's say, an exaggerated representation of the diamond ring effect. So what about eclipse science? So there's a lot we have learned from eclipses. Now, one uh, thing we learned has to do with the shape of the Earth. So a big piece of evidence for the shape of the Earth came to us by looking at lunar eclipses, where we see the shadow of the Earth projected onto the moon, and that shadow is circular. Now, if the Earth were triangular, one would expect the shadow of the Earth to look like a triangle. And that concept is demonstrated uh, in this uh, illustration from the early 1700s. And it was in the fourth century that BC that Aristotle first proposed that the earth was round in shape based on his observations of a lunar eclipse. Furthermore, using geometry, Aristarchus made use of a lunar eclipse to determine the relative sizes of the sun and the moon and their relative distances. And the image shown here uh, is a 16th century illustration of Aristarchus's work. Now, the oldest written record we have of the sun's corona dates to 968. And there was a question, and it persisted for quite a while, as to whether or not the corona, uh, incidentally, a term that wasn't invented until 1809, whether or not the corona was associated with the sun or the moon, or was it something going on in our atmosphere? And it was Galileo who first suggested uh, that this thing that we now know as the corona was actually the result of sunlight reflecting off of the moon's atmosphere. But it was Miraldi who proposed that the corona was a part of 
the sun. And that was because during a solar eclipse, he observed that the moon traverses the corona over the course of the eclipse. And this is what is dubbed the first useful photo of a total eclipse, and it's dated to 1851. And it was a, a daguerreotype. And daguerreotypes are not the best because they required a long exposure, so their quality was iffy. Uh, other astronomers at other locations were also observing this eclipse. And fortunately, by comparing their independent observations, they were able to deduce that prominences were part of the sun uh, and not the moon. And again, it's because the moon was seen to cover and uncover these features as it moved in front of the sun. And this is also called the first true photograph of a totally eclipsed sun. Uh, but it's actually, uh, I would say, probably appropriate to say it's the first photograph of the sun and its prominences. And that was the whole purpose of the camera that Warren De La Rue built. He wanted to answer the question of what was the nature of these prominences. So he built a device. It was half telescope, half camera, and it was the first instrument built specifically for observing uh, a lunar eclipse. And the name of this device is called a Q photoheliograph. So as you can see in the matter of nine years, we've made significant advances in our observational science because of advances we've made in our instrumentation. Now, 1860 was a boon year, uh, and it was the most observed and studied total solar eclipse up to that point in time. And that's because the path of totality cut across both the North American continent and the European continent. And it also marks the first time uh, that we know of that a coronal mass ejection was observed. And that's a feature that you see in these top three images at about the five o'clock position in the sketches. And coronal mass ejections are basically huge magnetic field driven plasma explosions that can make our life a real misery. In the 1868 eclipse, this was the first eclipse uh, following Gustav Kirchhoff's uh, theory about Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum being uh, emission lines of the elements that were present in the sun. As a result of this knowledge, two astronomers, Janssen and Lockyer, independent, independently discovered a new element. And it was Lockyer who got to uh, name the uh, element, and he called it helium after the Greek word for sun, which is helios. And we didn't discover helium here on Earth until 1895. Probably the most Famous scientific experiment of all for a solar eclipse was in testing Einstein's theory of general relativity. Einstein's theory made a prediction that astronomers were able to directly test. That prediction was that the path of light from distant stars would be bent by specified amounts. And it was easy to test. First, you photograph the stars when the sun wasn't in the area, right? And then you photograph the stars during a solar eclipse when those stars are very near the sun uh, and the path of their light would pass very close to the sun. You then measure the differences between your two sets of photographic plates. Uh, 
if there were no differences between your two sets of plates, then Einstein was wrong and Newton was right. But guess what? The differences that were seen were a match for what Einstein's equations predicted. So a wonderful example of isn't science great? And yeah, the days really are getting longer in spite of what people might think. Uh, curiously, you know, well, if you think about it, if you can predict something going into the future, then you can also predict what happened in the past. But in examining our predictions of when and where past eclipses occurred, it just didn't line up with the records uh, at that time. But they would line up if the Earth's rotation rate were actually slowing down. And so this is an interesting uh, paper that looked at measurements uh, of the Earth's rotation based on studying not just solar eclipses, but lunar occultations of stars to the point that they had data for them. And they were able to determine that the Earth's rate of rotation is slowing down by a whopping 1.8 milliseconds every 100 years. So that's some pretty cool science, I think. So I just want to take some time and talk about the geometry that makes eclipses possible. The key factors for solar eclipses are the distances and relative sizes of our performers, as well as their orientation in space. Uh, because our orbit around the sun is not a circle, but an ellipse, our distance from the sun varies. And consequently, the apparent size of the sun in the sky varies over the course of a year. And the orbit of a moon around the earth is not a circle, but an ellipse. So the distance between the moon and the earth varies as well. So the apparent size of the moon in the sky varies. And from the, what are the odds of that category? It just so happens that the sun is not only 400 times larger than the moon, but it's also about 400 times farther away. And as a consequence, they both appear to be about the same size in our sky. So uh, this illustration I made is meant to give you a rough idea of how the apparent size of the moon and sun vary from smallest to largest uh, over the course of a year. And because we've got the Earth orbiting the sun and the moon orbiting the Earth, we get this cool visual geometry. So how we see the moon is tied to the geometry of the moon's location relative to the Earth and the sun. So the phases of the moon are easily seen in this outer circle uh, of moons. And the smaller inner circle makes it clear from which direction the sun is coming, which is to our right. Now, with the sun to the right, we have a new moon when the moon is between us and the sun. So. This is when a solar eclipse can take place. Alternatively, when the moon is opposite the sun, we see a full moon. And that's when a lunar eclipse can take place. Now, the Earth orbits the sun in its own orbital plane. In fact, we define everything in terms of the plane of our orbit around the sun, which we call the ecliptic. From our perspective, the orbit of Mars around the sun is tilted, but a Martian would say, no, it's the Earth's orbit that's tilted. But in this debate, we win, right? So relative to the ecliptic, the orbit of the moon is tilted by about five degrees. So geometrically, the only time we'll have a solar eclipse is first when the moon is directly between the Earth and the sun, and second, when the moon is at a point in its orbit where it's intersecting the Earth's orbit around the sun. And these two points are known as the ascending node and the descending node. So only at these two times 
can we experience a solar eclipse? And these other terms here, you may hear spoken of with respect to eclipse cycles, uh, but I'm not going to drag you into that particular set of weeds. Uh, feel free to explore them on your own. Now, there are actually three types of solar eclipses. First, we have a total solar eclipse. And this is where the distance of the moon from the Earth is such that the focus point of the moon's shadow is inside the Earth so that we are within the umbra, that totality of moon shadow. Uh, people within the umbra's footprint will experience a total eclipse, while people who are outside that area but within the penumbra footprint, they'll experience a partial eclipse. The second type of solar eclipse is the annular eclipse. This is what we had last October. Uh, in this case, the distance between the Earth and the Moon is greater so that the focus point of the umbra is somewhere over our heads out in space. So in that case, we're all in the penumbra. None of us are going to see a total eclipse. And of course, the moon being further away from the Earth means that the moon's apparent diameter is a little bit smaller as well, so it doesn't have the same covering effect. Now, the third type of eclipse, which is certainly the weirdest of the three, is what's called a hybrid eclipse. And this is where the geometry is so persnickety that depending where you are along the path of totality, you may experience a total eclipse because the umbers focus point is inside the Earth, or you may experience an annual, annular eclipse because the distances have changed to the point that the umbra has moved out of the Earth and up into space. Uh, fairly rare, but I would be upset if I was getting a annular eclipse and not a total eclipse. So this is a pretty cool NASA animation of the upcoming eclipse uh, that shows the path and size of the moon's shadow or penumbra and the path of totality and its size. So that little black speck is the umbra, the area within which people will see a total eclipse. The large dark area is the penumbra and people within its boundaries are going to experience a partial eclipse. And obviously, as you move out away from the umbra towards the edge of the penumbra, uh, less and less of the sun will be covered by the moon. And for a different perspective, here's a photo of an eclipse from 1999 uh, as seen from the Mir space station. So there are plans to view the upcoming eclipse from the International Space Station, but those plans are not yet finalized due to uncertainties about where exactly ISS will be in space at the time of the eclipse. Now, of course, as we get closer and closer to that date, ISS's orbital position will be known with much greater precision. And I've got a couple of animations, not so bad if we've got time afterwards, if anyone wants me to play them, uh, I will. Uh, the first animation is something of a repeat of uh, what you just saw, except for the 2017 solar eclipse. And the second one gives you a little better look at the geometry as to why we do and don't always have eclipses. Um, but one site I would like to direct your attention to, and I'm going to paste all these links into the chat at the end. Um, the I, NASA's Eyes on the Solar System has this very cool simulator for the upcoming eclipse. So I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, if you can't wait, just type in, you know, 
eyes on the solar system. And I really like this one. So I encourage you to pay a visit and uh, look at the trek of the Umbra across, uh, you know, the American continent. So last October, we had the opportunity to see an annular eclipse. Uh, but more importantly, we've got a great chance to see a total eclipse April 8th. And let me warn you, if you miss it and you don't like to travel, you're going to have to wait until 2044 for an eclipse path to again cross some part of the mainland U.S. If you're willing to travel, the next total eclipse is going to be in 2026. And it will pass over parts of uh, Greenland and Spain. And my being in Illinois means I'm particularly interested in the path that totality uh, that is nearest to where I live. Um, anyone within this dark area here is going to experience a total eclipse. The closer you are to the center line, the longer that a total eclipse will last. Um, and these, you may see some angled lines that are paralleling the umbra's path. Uh, those lines are meant to indicate how much of the sun's surface area will be covered by the moon's disk. So for someone up in Milwaukee, uh, for them, 90% of the sun will be covered. And it's, I just threw this graphic up because it's from the Adler Planetarium here in Chicago. If you're ever here, be sure to visit them. And it's meant to give Illinois residents a visual idea of what they will see both from within the area of totality and from other locations uh, around the state. And again, the key point to remember is that the closer you are to the center line of totality, the longer that totality will last for you. And we're talking a totality that only up to like four minutes, and it will go by really quickly. Um, this is another website uh, I highly recommend. This is a simulation of the solar eclipse. It's provided by NASA's Space Visualization Studio. Uh, and as you can see, these concentric yellow cir circles, which are indicating how long you will have totality for. So as you see, if you, you've got four minutes of totality, Texas, Arkansas, Illinois, but that four minute dies out in Indiana. And thereafter, you're only going to get three minutes of totality. But now what's particularly cool about this particular app uh, is that you can type in your zip code. So I put my zip code in and you will see that it's telling me that first contact is going to be at 1251 in the afternoon, that maximum coverage of the sun will be 92.7% and that's gonna happen at 207 in the afternoon. And the sun will fully reemerge from behind the moon at 321. Um, there's also a nice uh, simulator to show you at actual speed or uh, at a heightened speed the path that the sun's umbra will take uh, across the U.S. It's really cool. In fact, uh, if we have time, I've got this website up right now. We can go play a little bit at the end. But it's kind of remarkable uh, that, you know, the, an eclipse is an odd thing in that it's slow, but it's also very fast. The total duration for any location of an eclipse is a couple of hours, but the totality itself is only a few minutes. And this table shows you uh, the starting time and ending time um, for uh, the eclipse at various locations along the path of totality. And as you can see from the time the eclipse starts, it takes about an hour to reach totality. 
you get a few minutes of totality and then another hour plus to completely escape totality. And now I want to talk a little bit about viewing an eclipse. Um, when it comes to looking at the eclipse, you basically have two options. Uh, the first option is what's called direct viewing. And this is where you have some device between you and the sun through which you look directly at the sun. The second option is what's called indirect viewing. And this is where you use some device to project the sun's image onto some surface. And that's what you look at. And for that, you don't need eye protection. Now, the only time you can ever look directly at a solar eclipse without some form of protection is during those few minutes of totality. And you can never look directly at an annular eclipse only at a total eclipse. And during those, those uh, few minutes of totality, you may, you may be taking pictures or looking through a filtered telescope or binoculars or something, uh, but from what people have shared with others, at some point, you do want to take that stuff off and look up directly at the total eclipse and experience it just the way our ancestors experienced it. So for direct viewing, probably uh, the, the, the cheapest and most convenient way to view the eclipse is using either handheld solar filters or solar filters that are designed to be worn as glasses. This is the easiest and cheapest uh, merchandise route for you to pursue, and it gives you a good field of view, too. Now, if you want to go the homemade route, one of the most popular uh, homemade solutions for indirect viewing uh, is to grab a cereal box. Uh, you're going to make a, pin a pinhole projector. So you're going to cut out two squares at the top of the box. You're going to tape white paper across the bottom of the box. And then on one of those two squares that you cut out, you're gonna tape it over with aluminum foil. Then you're just gonna take a needle and poke a hole in the aluminum foil. Uh, then you then direct it over your shoulder so that the sun shines in through that hole and projects the image of the sun onto that white sheet of paper. And again, you, because this is indirect viewing, you don't need any eye protection for this. Uh, you can also use a binocular projection for indirect viewing. Now, the nice thing about this is that a group of people can all share the same view. Uh, and you will note that this person is using only one lens, which is unfiltered, and the other lens ha does have a lens cap in place. So I don't recommend using expensive binoculars for this because uh, the internal heating that gets created by the sun's rays could hurt your lenses. Uh, if I'm going to use binoculars, I would prefer direct viewing using binoculars that have been fitted out with solar filters. And you can see that this person has two uh, solar filters in place, so they get the full binocular vision. But what you could do is just buy one filter and then leave your lens cap on the other lens of your binocular. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, squinting and looking using just uh, one eye. And if you have an SLR camera and you want to take eclipse photos, you need to buy solar filter, which come in a range of sizes and prices. Uh, you can see that for both of these two filters, they tell you how many f-stops that uh, the incoming light is being reduced by. Minimally, 
you want a filter that will reduce the amount of light by 16 f-stops, which is a lot. Uh, and don't make the mistake of using neutral density filters. Uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, and yes, you can take the filter off your camera or your binocular while totality is underway. Just don't forget to put it back on once totality ends. And if you do decide to do some research uh, on your own online, be careful about the sources. Uh, when I was poking around, I came across this website. And I don't know what to make of it. It is not recommended that you look at the sun through a telescope or binoculars, but you should do so only when the sky is clear. Uh, what? Uh, and that Optical equipment, the sun's harmful rays are neutralized unless there is a solar filter. Okay, I'm getting the feeling that maybe this was auto-translated or something. Clearly, whoever wrote this did not speak English. Um, so I would be leery about buying anything from these people. So just exercise caution if you're going to be going online for how-to instructions, uh, or if you're going to be going online to purchase uh, viewing equipment, only buy from re reputable brands from reputable dealers. Here's a long list, or actually it's my short list of resources. I'm gonna paste all of this into the chat, so don't bother trying to uh, copy it out. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to copy the chat itself. And lastly, this is a cool Psy Games uh, is a very cool map uh, of the eclipse. And all those circles represent libraries that have some kind of eclipse event. So we can zoom in. In fact, I'm going to flip over. I'll flip over here right now. And you can see this is a part of the StarNet Libraries Network. We can clip on the map here. And as you zoom in, you see these little explosions of libraries. So the good news is it is, oh, look, here's a library right near the path of totality, Van Buren County Library. Unfortunately, uh, you're not provided with any information as to what their event is or when it will be held. So you would have to separately look up the contact information for Van Buren County Library find the website and see what's going on. Uh, but this, it is useful for finding libraries in your uh, area uh, that are engaged. Okay, I have to satisfy my curiosity. Let's see, okay, here. Yeah, see, I, I'll be speaking at the Lake Villa District Library, but I don't know if this is my event that they're, they've registered or something else that's already happened. Uh, the other website that I had suggested you use was this one. Uh, and I'll paste the link for this into the chat as well. Uh, but the very cool thing here is that we can run a simulation We've got bookmarks there. So let's play. And right here, you'll see, let's go back a bit. And let's go to 60 times the speed. And here you can see this is the Umbra moving along its path. So you can see exactly what the time is and where the Umbra is. But the best part of this, and we're going to pause that, is... As I say, I'm at 60193. And you see, I am told, I've been given all the information that I need uh, to record if I want to view the eclipse from the area of my 
uh, zip code. So I would encourage everyone here to take advantage of this. And this is from, again, from the NASA Space Visualization Studio. And I will, again, be pasting these into the chat. And let's see here. And that is the end of my presentation. And so I will be happy to take questions. Uh, we can play on the websites. I can show you those two videos if you like. Um, so, Bert, I'll keep my file sharing open. Okay. Or my excuse me, my screen sharing. Let me go into the chat and see what we've got here. Got a few questions that I see here in Q and A. Okay. Uh, let's see. Looks like Carl was busy with a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, Carl is always busy with a lot of questions. <laughs> um. Okay, Carl. Okay, can I be snarky with an answer for you? Uh, what kind of solar phenomena should we be looking for? And I would say whatever kind you can see. So you are, if you're just looking naked eye, you are not going to see a prominence. Um, if you're using a telescope that's fitted out with, you know, solar filters uh, with sufficient magnification, then yeah, you're, you should be able to observe uh, solar prominences. Uh, so again, and in terms of you're using one of the pinhole projectors, really the only thing you're going to be able to see is the shape of the moon moving across the surface of, excuse me, of the sun. You may be able to make out some sunspots depending on how dark the location is in which you've got that reflective surface. Uh, if you've got it out in the open and you're experiencing a partial eclipse, the contrast is going to be so low that you'll have difficulty seeing anything. Um, so it depends on your viewing method most heavily. Uh, but you definitely, uh, I would want to try and spot the corona um, and just observe uh, how even or uneven it is, uh, its extent. Remembering the size of the sun in our sky is about half a degree, and that equates to one and a half million kilometers. So you know approximately that size, and if you can see how far away uh, the corona is extending from the sun, that'll give you an idea of the size of the feature you're seeing. Uh, Carl, what type of equipment should we have? I guess that depends on how much money you're willing to spend. If you have an old pair of binoculars, you could do that whole binocular projection thing. If you're willing to spend money for filters, you can do that. Oh, one thing I forgot, a, a number of the libraries uh, have gotten good numbers of the filtered solar glasses and your library may have them and they might be willing to give some you know one per person away i don't know what your library's uh you know process is if they do that or if they sell them for a nominal fee uh it may be a bit late to try and buy glasses online uh, and I certainly wouldn't buy, I shouldn't say glasses, I should say filters. I certainly wouldn't buy any from a brand or dealer I didn't recognize, because this is your eyes we're talking about, okay? So, visual precautions. Oh, thank you. That's a good question, Carl. Uh, something uh, I forgot to mention is if these are your solar filters, so hopefully you can see what I'm doing. Don't look at the sun and then put on your glasses. You're, you're looking away, you look down, you put your glasses on, and only then do you look up at the sun. So you don't want to have any instance of looking directly at the sun without some type of filtering device 
between the sun and your eyes. Uh, why are so actually solar eclipses are not at all rare. Uh, we get on average like two a year. And there have even been a, some years where we've had up to five eclipses in a year. Uh, it's just that, you know, given the size of the Earth, 70% ocean, uh, eclipses will occur on the other side of the world or someplace where there's nobody around to see them. And if you think about it, we really only hear about eclipses when they're in our neighborhood. And if you recall from that slide early in my talk, the same location on Earth experiences a total eclipse only once every 375 years versus the Earth experiencing anywhere from two to five eclipses a year. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. When in history was it revealed that they... Uh, Carl, you'll have to elaborate on your question. When in history was it revealed that they are physical phenomena? I, mean, I don't know what the they are that you're referring to. Uh, so I'll skip that for now. Just add it in later. Uh, do some cultures still believe they are supernatural? I have mixed feelings about this. I, I attended a professional development webinar from NASA. 40 minutes long, the first 10 minutes was spent talking about cultural sensitivity and that there are uh, cultures for which viewing the sun is, still cultures out there, that viewing the sun is tab taboo. You're not supposed to be showing people pictures of the sun. Uh, so yes, there are still cultures out there Um for which the sun has re the sun itself has religious significance. Uh, will the eclipses have some type of effect on astronauts on ISS? I guess the answer to that is going to depend on which side of the Earth they're on. As I say, they still don't know um, ex precisely how well. ISS will be placed in relation to uh, the eclipse path. And that's because the ISS orbit is altered. They may have to maneuver to avoid debris collisions. Um, so their orbit is much more variable than the orbit of the moon, for example. Uh, what effects might they have uh, pioneers on space settlements? Um, other than missing the fact that they won't get to experience an eclipse, uh, none. But if you think about it, remember, you got to have the exact precise geometry for a space settlement to experience an, an eclipse at some point in time. Well, now think about this. We experience an eclipse because of the Earth, Moon, sun geometry. If you're in a space colony, you've got the colony moon sun geometry and the colony moon sun geometry. So depending on where they are, who knows, maybe eclipses will be more common or less common for them. How far back in history were people able to predict eclipses? Uh, again, that goes back to what I was saying. They could, they were pretty good. The ancients were pretty good about predicting approximately when an eclipse would occur, you know, sometime this week, somewhere. They could do that, uh, but they weren't so good at saying where it would occur. Uh, whereas we can plot out, you know, the umbra will be at this latitude and this longitude at exactly this time. They could not do that. So uh, their degree of accuracy was very poor, which is why uh, Halley's uh, prediction is considered to be the first real uh, 
total eclipse prediction because it did go to that level of detail. Uh, there is no relationship between sunspot cycles and solar eclipses. Uh, unless you want to say, I mean, you could say they're related because, you know, one is 22 years, but that has more to do with just the nature of the sun and not the orbital position of the moon or the earth. Does quantum mechanics give us a deeper understanding of the fusion process? For that, you would have to ask uh, a physicist, not me, because that that is not my area of expertise. So I, I can imagine what the answer is, but I'm not even going to go there. It would be inappropriate. How well does a pinhole camera work in observing the eclipse? It works and it's cheap. And it's a view that's shareable. So um, if you're an adult and you have a group of three or four kids, a pinhole projector is really uh, your only option. Now, some people for partial eclipses, um, all you need is a small hole. So you could get a piece of paper and poke 30, 40 holes in it in a pattern. And when you hold it up, you know, above the ground and the sunlight shines through, you get all these little miniature replicas of the partial eclipse. I uh, saw a picture online of someone using a colander for just that effect. So pinhole cameras uh, are great for, let's say, last minute and you don't have any direct viewing equipment or you have kids and you want to share the experience with the children and have it so that they can see the eclipse and you can point things out to them. But in something like that, I would say the binocular projection is better because you want it, you want a larger uh, image. Uh, and again, you want to have it in a high contrast environment. So you want it to be, you want your white reflective surface to be isolated from, uh, you know, the incidental light that's in the area. Can long-term records of solar eclipses provide some info about the Milankovitch effect? Um, no, because those are two independent things. And the Milankovitch cycle runs on a much longer uh, time scale. Uh, because it's tied to the procession of the Earth's axis. Uh, do you know of any studies have been made regarding psychological effects? Is, um, I don't. I'm not aware of it. That's something that has, doesn't have appeal to me, so I've never bothered to go down that particular road. So sorry, I can't answer you that one, Carl. What is the best online site to observe it? Now, that's a good question. Uh, there's going to be a number of sites, and because I haven't tried out live observing sites, I, I can't tell you uh, what would be the best online site for observing. If you have a local science museum, I would contact them and see if they have any recommendations. Um, I know some years ago here in Chicago, we've got the Adler Planetarium. Uh, now this is before, uh, this was a while ago. They did have viewing. I don't know if they're going to have an online viewing option. I haven't visited their website recently. So, but that's a good question. And it is something for folks to think about. Because really, if you think about it, if I decide to stay here and see a partial eclipse, and, which is 
I was going to look at the annular eclipse, but guess what? We were clouded out the entire day. So, and there's no guarantee that wherever I would have driven to would not have been clouded out. So the nice thing about the online option is if one observatory is cl clouded out, there's always another one out there that may be open. So I would say in the weeks before the eclipse, it would be a good time to check out what are the online viewing options for the solar eclipse. And I confess that is not something I have done yet. What are the shadow bands that may be seen on a white sheet placed on the ground? I'm not sure that I follow you on that one. And I think that was all the questions that are currently in the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've checked the chat as well, Jim, and it looks like you've got most of the questions that were submitted beforehand as well. Uh, let me see if I see any that uh, that looks like we've missed. Um, no, it looks like you've get, you know Carl gave you a great summary in in effect of uh, everything that. Uh, 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 well, here's a, here's one that wasn't discussed, and you you kind of touched on it, but uh, are there any advancements in solar science that have come out of studying solar eclipses? Um, I would say uh, perhaps primarily the study of the sun's corona. You may recall that one image where you use the uh, solar uh, chronograph to. Uh, study the temperature of the corona, which tells you a lot about the sun's magnetic field, because that's really uh, a huge driver of what's happening on the sun. In fact, that is one of the big solar mysteries, is that why is the corona millions of degrees hotter than the photosphere or the chromosphere? by rights, because they're closer to the sun, they should be much hotter. And so it's, there is no conclusive answer to right. that yet. So um, it's, the sun is just this puzzle that we keep, you know, fitting more and more pieces together to improve our understanding. And I saw Bert on your introductory slide that you had mentioned that there might be an upcoming presentation on the Parker Solar Probe. And that's something that people should really, if you're interested in solar physics uh, and the sun, that's something you should keep an eye out for because that uh, the data we get back from that uh, could really advance our understanding of the sun uh, because it, I mean, it's central to our lives. Right. Uh, we did get someone who raised her hand. Uh, I see it's Eric. I've allowed, Eric, uh, I, you, you're able to uh, ask a question and you just need to unmute. Eric, can you hear me? I can hear you. I there you go. Did. Perfect. Go ahead and ask your question. I bumped that by accident. I don't have a question. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, we thought we would get one last question in. Uh, Jim, it looks like you've got everything. Uh, I would suggest everybody that if you do need to get equipment, uh, get it in a hurry, because I remember during the eclipse back in 2017, uh, things got sold out fast, and then people started raising their prices. So glasses don't cost that much. They shouldn't cost more than a few dollars for each one. Uh, and I, you know, I've got a box of them here that I bought a while back. Uh, Bert, do you know if the chat, if uh, attendees are, are able to copy? Out I, I know they've had problems in the past with copying. What we can do is I suggest they take a screenshot if you put the information in but I will save the uh, chat. Uh, I would I would say can uh, 
someone, uh, whatever's in the check, can someone try to copy it and paste it into a document on your computer and then give us a uh, heads up as to whether or not, and then I'll paste all these links into the chat. But I can also send it out to everybody. Oh, I tell you what then, um, if you're going to do that, I can uh, send you uh, a list of all the links. And right. people are welcome. My email address is here on the screen. You're welcome to email me uh, if you have a question that you think of later uh, that you want to ask me or if you want some other kind of uh, information. Uh, don't hesitate to email me. And what you have, Jim, you send me those. I will get them out uh, over the weekend to everybody. Yes. Yes. Uh, because there's some great, you got some, I didn't even aware that those existed. Those are some great uh, websites. Yeah. I love that one. That one is fabulous. This uh, is the one I encourage everyone to yeah. use if you're going to, whether you're staying home, because uh, you, you will have some part, you will have, you know, see some part of an eclipse. Um, so if you're staying home, you can find out exactly when it's happening in your area. Or if you're looking at different destinations because you're willing to drive for a few hours, you can use the same tool uh, to find out uh, how appropriate uh, that destination is going to be for you. So I just pasted this one link into the chat. Uh, Let's see, does someone want to try to copy it? I know I can, but I don't know if anyone else well, can. Well, that's because you're special, Bert. That's right. Uh, oh, Jim, you might want to do that is make sure every, put paste it for everyone. Right now, it's only to the host and panelists. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, just make everyone. sure it's to everyone. Yeah. I need to paste to everyone. There we go. There we go. Yeah. And see if they can get it. I tried to copy and paste. It couldn't paste. Okay, okay. thanks, Eric. Yeah, that's kind, kind of what I thought. Uh, because of the uh, webinar versus a yeah yeah I don't know why they do that but uh, but everybody uh, we will take care of it make sure you get that or again you know you can always just take a quick screenshot of it as well but I'll make sure everyone gets these great well very good Jim that was that was really fabulous uh, oh I so oh Bill got it let's see Bill put in a comment there he got his Celestron Solar Eclipse kit okay. Ah, yeah. Okay, glasses. Okay. Uh oh, a cam a, a cell phone camera filter. That's a that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Now I I I've heard good things about this. I can't think of the name. I'll try to find the link for you. But evidently, there is supposed to be there is an app for your phone that will allow you to use your phone to photograph the sun, and it's oh, okay. Yeah. It's an app you have to purchase. It's not free. Um, so I was kind of wondering about that. You know, I wasn't sure if I want to really point my phone camera. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a tricky one. Uh, uh, let me see. I think the, did someone just raise their hand there? Uh, okay, no, I don't see it there. Okay. Uh, well, very good. Uh, that Jim, that was great. Uh, really enjoyable. Learn. I learned a lot about uh, solar eclipses that I and and I think you you pointed out a really good question when we were saying, oh, solar eclipses are rare. But when you really think about it, you're right. They occur uh, all over the Earth a few times a year. It's just a question of you know we're nowhere near them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you know we tend to not new. The media, where whatever country they're in, they care about what's happening first in their country. Exactly. So, yeah, I don't know how much reporting of this solar eclipse is going to happen in Asia, Africa, maybe some in Europe because of the strong astronomical community there. Maybe some in South America because we're kind of close. You know, uh, but now I'm sure the 2026 eclipse is going to get a lot of coverage in Spain right. and Greenland because those are basically the only two countries that are going to experience it. The rest of the time, it's over the Atlantic Ocean. Right. Uh, Bill asked if he can maybe uh, share the presentation. Is that possible, Jim? 
Uh, given that I'm still giving the presentation. Oh, okay. No. So you will be able to see it because now correct me if I'm wrong, but this is probably going to wind up on YouTube. Uh, we've recorded it and we will be posting it on YouTube. Yes. So, okay. So you, you will have access to the material. And that will be long before the eclipse. So uh, Fred will turn it around pretty fast and we'll get that out. Uh, but if you get me the uh, the links, I'll get them out right away to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I will, let's see, let me go back to my, uh, if I can get back to my presentation, go. And if anyone does want to do a screen, a, a screenshot, a screenshot, you know, <laughs> these are the main uh, links that there are. Do a quick one for myself right now. I just did it. So one that's easy to use is eclipse.aas.org. Uh, they have a lot of resources there, particularly if you're looking to purchase equipment. They do have recommendations uh, as to, you know, brands and suppliers. Uh, so I would, and I've actually got AAS down there twice. I've got their top level eclipse address as well as their how to view a solar eclipse safely address, which I would encourage people to use. Absolutely. And the very bottom one, cygames.org slash eclipse slash map. That's the one that has uh, the listings of all the libraries. Right. Participate. Right. So. I was thinking if I'm going to drive somewhere, I can look to see, okay, is there a library near the center line of totality? I can call them up and see if they have an event going on real time in order to take advantage of it and just drive down there and use them as a base of observation. Great. Uh, I see Fred just posted that we'll have the video up there by tomorrow. So great. We'll get to, so everybody uh, will get the video out uh, and also the the links out uh, tomorrow as well. So very good, Jim. Thank you so much. It was great presentation. Well, thank you, Bert. Okay. Uh, yep. Let me, I'll share my screen. I've stopped sharing. <laughs> oh, great. Yep. I will share one more time. But again, thanks so much, Jim. And also I wanted to thank uh, Anita. Gail, our CEO, for joining us tonight. And of course, uh, my colleagues, uh, Fred Becker, and also Larry Ahern, who was not able to join us this evening. Thanks, Anita. Yep, uh, it was a really great presentation. So everybody, I'm just going to remind you that uh, we will be back next week uh, for another uh, Space Forum. So don't miss that, uh, as you want to learn a lot about what's going on with uh, the Space Coast. And we might also be able to get an update. Uh, I believe Starship is scheduled to launch uh, on the same day, the 14th. Uh, so, but I heard there might be some bad weather that day, uh, but we'll see what happens. But hopefully it'll be a fun, a com a fun conversation uh, because, you know, they just unveiled the, uh, the New Glenn rocket uh, that uh, Blue Origin is going to be launching later this year. So that's part of the things we'll be discussing next week. So join us. Uh, we'll get an invitation out probably uh, on Monday, so look for that. So everyone, thank you for attending this evening. Uh, it's been great. For those of you in this time zone and, and other related time zones, have a great evening. If you are in tomorrow's time zone, have a great day <laughs> and also a great weekend ahead. So everybody stay safe and we'll see you on the 14th. Take care, everybody.